has an inherent baseball to move away from a close, compact stadium like Ebbets Field into these large metropolitan stadiums where the fans are miles from the from the wet, if you will. Here, Ebbets Field was it was uh, there was an interpersonal relationship between the players and the fans, and uh, a favorite moment in the boys of summer it was when. Duke Snyder said, the fans in Brooklyn are the worst fans in baseball. And there are nine newspaper men are traveling with the team. And this is in the Ebbetsfield Clubhouse. And Pee Wee Reese, a diplomat, the captain of the team, said, uh, he's just talking, meaning don't, no, nobody, write, nobody write this. He said, I am not just talking. I want to see it in the paper. <laughs> and so his wish was granted. And it was in all the afternoon papers. And uh, the next day, there was a night game. And the people came out to Ebbetsfield with signs. And the sign said, Snyder, go back to California. Uh, you could hear it back and forth. You could feel it. There was a chemistry of the intimate ballpark. Now I really can't tell whether I'm in Cincinnati or St. Louis or Philadelphia. There's this kind of institutional architecture, the same drabness that you get in institutional housing. Like staying at a Holiday Inn. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. Uh, Look, the psychology of uh, the professional athlete, which you touched on uh, indirectly. I mean, your whole story is about men who lived in a glory time, and then you came back to see them when the glory is gone. Uh, and some of them are kind of down and out. Uh, what, 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 what is the, 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 the life after for the professional athlete as you see it? Well, with, the, with the, the boys of summer, the first thing that happens is you have to re remake your life. You know, I think the boys of summer comes from Dylan Thomas. I see the boys of summer in their ruin. Uh, there is this measure of ruin when you're 33. And you have the memory of a great overhand curve if you're Carl Erskine, but you don't have the overhand curve. You have the memory at 37 of a perfect swing if you're Duke Snyder, but you don't have that swing. You have the memory of dozens and dozens of steals of home by Jackie Robinson when you're 36, but your legs are gone. So the first thing you have to do, or try to do, is make an adjustment to this shattering psychological fact that you've faced a certain kind of death. You're dead as an athlete, and now you have to go and build a, build a new life, build a fresh life, and not live in the past. And uh, you know, you, you, you're just one more old ball player. Are those, are those athletes capable of doing that, of rebuilding that life? Well, the you know, the most, most of, many of them are. Uh, uh, Robinson is uh, going into politics as he was a winner in baseball, he's been a loser in politics. He backed uh, uh, Nixon in 60 when Kennedy won, and then he backed Rockefeller in 64 uh, when Goldwater won. And his whole political career uh, was as unsuccessful as his baseball career was glorious. Uh, but Jack, and he's had great tragedy. Uh, he's had a heart attack. He has diabetes, and he's having trouble with the sight of uh, one eye. And his first son. Uh, a soldier in Vietnam, got hooked on heroin, came back, cured himself, and then died in an auto accident at 24. Jack's a brave, fierce man, and uh, there's nothing sad about Jack. Jack says, there's no real place for the ex-athlete. Uh, I can't be an ex-athlete. I have to be something else. So he's an official at a bank, and he has a construction business. Carl Erskine, vice president of a bank. Uh, he has a retarded child, a mongoloid child, and much of his life is a devotion to raising that mongoloid child. Now, Erskine said his, the greatest moment of his life was not setting a World Series strikeout record, uh, not uh, pitching two no-hit games, not when he was one of the boys of summer, but a while ago in a YMCA swimming pool in Anderson, Indiana, when his little boy, Jimmy, 12, started to swim across the pool. And this was the day that this mongoloid was going to swim the width of the pool. And he got halfway across and frightened and looked to his father. And Erskine wouldn't help Jimmy. And he said, I looked in his face and I read betrayal. And then Jimmy struggled and got all the way across the pool. And Erskine says, the look in Jimmy's face when he made it, that was the greatest moment of my life, not anything connected with baseball. That's, uh, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. The, uh, the Jackie Robinson story, it's, it's a lot, you call them the Jackie Robinson Dodgers and, and what have you. Uh, how, how, why was Jackie Robinson's story not really covered at the time in the newspapers? It, it, one of you, you mentioned one of your stories, at least one that uh, was cut. I said, and censored, killed. say it, censored. Yeah. They killed it. They didn't want to do it. Well, I think there was a lot of resentment against Robinson. First, there was the kind of uh, 
uh, simple resentment, sort of, you know, redneck resentment, well, baseball should only be played by white people. I don't think that's any, an argument that anybody would take seriously anymore. If, if a black man has the reflexes and the skills to make a living as a ball player, well, who, who would deny him that? Uh, but the second thing about Jack was that he was proud, educated, and as I say, ferocious. I remember going back to the 30s, what was the image of the, of the black? It was then the Negro. It was sort of step and fetch it. Yao was a boss, and he was afraid of ghosts, and he was a sort of a docile, docile character. Here comes Robinson, and you know he's about as docile as a tornado. <laughs> so what about as subtle too. <laughs> yeah, you know, what you had to contend with, you know, was somebody with with many of the attributes of Derosier, many of the attributes of Stanky, uh, just this fierce, fierce man, and an awful lot of people felt, uh, well it's all right to have a black playing baseball, but this black is too combative. So now when I, th I th it was a great story, and I, it was, I tried to report what was going on on the field, and Robinson would come to bat in St. Louis, and a pitcher named Jerry Staley would shout, no wonder you can't get a decent shine in St. Louis anymore. So, and then Robinson would you know, just give, give as good as he got, and if I told you some of the things Robinson gave, it would be a long bleep, uh, and then he'd double the left. There was a pitcher with a high, with a high uh, tenor voice, and Robinson would, would say to him, uh, Throw at me, dearie, throw at me, dearie, so, while he was batting. And uh, so there was this ferocious guy, and people resented him. You know, and a lot of people just, just, didn't, just didn't like him. Uh, he's a great friend of mine, you know, personally. Did you I, like him? Oh, yeah, a marvelous man. Uh, mm -hmm. Never, I mean, when I was a newspaper man, he'd say things. It would cause all kinds of furor, and if I quoted him, he never denied that he said it. Uh, when I was starving slowly on the Herald Tribune, getting, I think, it was seventy-two dollars a week was what I was getting when I was covering the Dodgers. Jack started a magazine, and he knew I was not not affluent, and he would I be his ghost? So as I say to him now, Jack, I was your pale ghost in another <laughs> era. Uh, I like him very much, and I, and I I think that you know part of living is uh, you know to have lost a son. And I'll never forget that funeral. He, he cried, of course, as he went into the funeral, and two men had to help him down the aisle. It was very, very, very moving to me because I think of Robinson on the bases and you know the speed, and there they're helping him. But at the end, he went out in the street, and he went out among the people of his ghetto in Brooklyn, and uh, wandered among the young people, touching them and, and maybe talking about the hell of heroin and uh, saying, "Stay off it." And uh, it was an act of great courage. You mentioned in the book uh, the reaction of some of the Dodgers, specifically Frillo and Billy Cox, to Jackie Robinson. But generally speaking, what was the how was how did the Dodger team, as in general, accept Jackie Robinson and the problems he caused? Well, generally, uh, generally they they accepted Jackie Robinson, and uh, curiously, from the cliche view of the United States that you can sometimes hear from a northern liberal. It was a Southerner, it was Pee Wee Reese, the son of a railroad detective, who was most instrumental on the team of accepting, of getting Robinson accepted. And Reese talks very movingly of being told one, on the way back from the war in the Pacific, on the way back from Manila, that the Dodgers had hired a, a black ball player, and he was a shortstop. And Reese re went to think, and he had a long time to think. It was a slow boat ride, and he thought a lot of things. He thought, well, supposing. So, well, he thought, nine positions and he's got to be a shortstop. That was the first thing he thought. And then the second thing is, he said, well, suppose he takes my job. Now I'm going to go back to Louisville, and I'll give you the word, because that's what Pee Wee said. And they're going to say to me, Reese, you weren't man enough to hold your job, even from a nigger. And then he thought some more, and he thought, well, with people like that, the hell with them. If I was in the colored league, what would I want? I'd want him to look not at my skin, I'd want him to look at how I played how I played the game. That's all I'd want him to do, and that's what I've got to do with this fella. And Pee Wee Reese was a guy who took his Sunday school lesson seriously. So then a petition developed among the Dodgers to have Robinson traded. Uh, Ricky had sent the Dodgers and Montreal on an exhibition tour in the Caribbean and in, in Panama. And he thought that when the Dodgers saw how good Robinson was, Robinson was then on the Montreal roster, they would demand that he be promoted. And there was, this, I think, a seven-game series, and Robinson batted 515. And the response to that from D Dixie Walker and a few others 
it was a petition saying, don't bring this man up or trade us. Well, they, they did bring him up, and the petition stopped at Reese. Reese didn't make a big sociological issue over it. He simply said, I just had a service. I've got a wife and a daughter. I need the money. I can't do anything that, that might cost me my job. I have to play. And the petition kind of stopped there.